Let's go ahead and, and get started. Um, Conrad, would you mind opening? Thank you. Amen. All right. Well, again, we are uh, we're in part 25 now of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and we finished what I wanted to finish as far as the battery of, of uh, passages in the New Testament for now, and we're going to the Old Testament. So I'm going to have you all turn to the Akedah, and I'll give you just a minute to do that. The Akedah. Yeah. Genesis 22. Genesis 22. <laughs> Not an aqueduct. Akada <laughs> uh, is uh, A K E D A H, and that's what. Is uh, that from the Apocrypha? <laughs> no. <laughs> Marcia and I rehearsed a little play on the way here. <laughs> Sounds like it would be. Yeah, she thinks it's from the Apocrypha. But no, it's not. It's Genesis 22. It is what the Jews call Genesis 22. Uh, the Akada, actually in Hebrew, it's A-Q-A-D. It's pronounced, pronounced uh, in the Hebrew, Akkad. Akkad. And it means binding. It means binding. And uh, can you guess why uh, the Jews call Genesis 22 the binding? Mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a shallow way, yeah. But uh, what is Genesis 22? What's contained there that you think we're going to cover tonight? Abraham's test. Abraham's test, where he did what to Isaac? And he didn't. And he didn't. <laughs> Akada. He provided a substitute. I'm going to have to call on Marcia, and she's a know-it-all, so. <laughs> it's where Isaac was bound. Uh, Isaac was bound. His father bound him and put him on the altar, if you'll remember that. Uh, and so that's, that's uh, Genesis 22, the first uh, 18, 19 uh, verses the Jews call Akedah. And, uh, and so we're going to begin here, and again, what I want to do is I want to look at types or shadows, foreshadows, or pictures of the crucifixion of Christ that God has provided us through the real lives of real people in the Old Testament. And it is amazing. You, you, uh, you will have trouble going uh, through the Old Testament without just running slam into them one after another. Uh, there are so many, and I'm going to pick some of the big ones. We're, we're not going to cover them all. We don't have that kind of time in our lives, I don't, in our lives, I don't think. But, uh, but we're going to look at some of the bigger ones and the ones that I feel like have really uh, illuminated themselves to me and, uh, and have done something for me, have... have uh, have made my faith stronger in, in the Lord because of these shadows. Uh, let's have somebody read verse 1 in Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Adam, Abraham, excuse me. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Okay, um, so it came to pass that God tested Abraham. We're going to talk about testing here in just a moment. Um, let's have somebody read verse 2. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. All right. You're going to find out there is, there, at least there's a lot I want to say. Uh, out of many of these verses, where a study like this is good because when we read at home, um, like I, I just restarted in the Bible a couple days ago, and I read through uh, through uh, sections of Genesis, and you just read. 
And, and yes, you're absorbing facts, but there's nothing like sitting down in a group like this and digging in and getting to know uh, what God had in mind for us and, and uh, the riches of his word. His word really is rich in meaning and rich in, in, uh, in instruction. And so uh, here are some things about those first couple of verses. Uh, in verse 2, you'll notice it says, your only son Isaac. True or false? False. false. Did he have another son? And that son's name? Ishmael. 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 Ishmael's mom was who? Hagar. Was who? Hagar. Hagar. And Hagar was? A servant of Sarah. Yeah, a servant. And, uh, and how did that all come about? Why does, why does Abraham have a son uh, before Isaac? It was. That's the problem. They did not wait on God. God had given them a promise, and they began to think, maybe we need to take this into our own hands. Is that always a good idea? I don't think it's ever a good idea if God gives you a direction uh, in his word or by his spirit or, or the way he's leading you. And you say, uh, he obviously needs some help. I'm going to have to help God. Um, that's never a good idea. Uh, God is quite capable of doing what he says he's going to do. Uh, but that's what happened. And so uh, Sarah gave uh, her handmaid to uh, Abraham uh, and she conceived and it was Ishmael. So what's the deal? Uh, your son, your only son, Isaac. Why would God say that? Is, did God, maybe, maybe Abraham didn't tell God about Ishmael. <laughs> Kept it a secret. Pardon me? That's the thing. Uh, he is the only son of the promise. Uh, God had said that Sarah would conceive. God had said that, that he would give Abraham a son. God was quite uh, knowledgeable in the fact that Abraham was married to Sarah. Uh, he didn't say, go find yourself some woman to have a son with. He said, you'll, you'll conceive a son. He meant that through Sarah. And he made that very plain a little later also. Um, and so he says, your only son. God's not even seeing that other son as the son of the promise or, or anything. Now, I'll tell you what, there are battles in the Middle East because of that, because of that, uh, because uh, birthright means a lot in the Middle East. It means a lot here sometimes when it comes to, um, to wills and last testaments and that kind of thing. Uh, but there it means a lot and wars are fought over this. And so uh, your son, your only son, uh, Ishmael, is not the son of promise. That was Isaac. Um, I want to also uh, look at, um, he says, uh, and go to the land of what? Moriah. Go to the land of Moriah. Um, Moriah, uh, this land of Moriah, in the land of Moriah, there is a mountain range, the Moriah mountain range uh, there. And this is um, the home of what? The Mariahs, yes. No. <laughs> Maybe it was. I don't know. All right, we'll get to that. We'll save this. Uh, but but uh, we won't save it for long because we're going to Second Chronicles chapter 3. If you'll turn there, hang on to where you're at in Genesis. But go to Second Chronicles chapter 3. I'll give you a verse here in just a minute. And we will begin to see the, the amazing, begin to see the amazing facts here. And, uh, and so let's have somebody read 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and just verse 1. And Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. For the Lord had appeared to his brother David, who was on the threshing floor of Aram, a shepherd's site, the place provided by David. All right. So... Uh, Solomon built the temple um, at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. The, this land of Moriah is, is where Jerusalem is. Let's take it a step further. Um, 
what I want you to picture here, and, and scripture doesn't come right out and say this, but why would God get in the parking lot and not go in the amusement park? That's what I'm saying. Why would God get so close to the hill of Calvary and not march Isaac up the hill of Calvary? I believe that what we're about to read, and we, we know this story, right? If we've been in church any length of time, we know this story about Abraham and Isaac, how, how uh, Isaac was to be sacrificed. That, that was his instructions to, to uh, God's instructions to Abraham. Um, this, this, I believe, I fully believe that the march that they're going to do up the hill is the hill of Calvary and where this altar was made by Abraham and where the sacrifice was to take place and where ultimately the sacrifice did take place, but not with Isaac, but a substitute. I believe this is where the cross was of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so, um, right from the get-go, we, we begin to see things unfold. And, and if we look at this, it's not a perfect picture. Not every single detail matches uh, the crucifixion, but so much of it does. You want to know something else really cool? In, uh, in verse, uh, going back to uh, Genesis 22, in verse uh, number 2, um, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you what? Love. Whom you love. <laughs> this is the very first time in the Bible that the word love is mentioned. The very first time. Uh, and it has to do with this shadow, this picture of Jesus. And immediately my heart goes to, to uh, John 3.16. Uh, immediately my heart goes there, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only begotten son, just like we're reading here, his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. It draws me also to, to Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his love in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, this, this is love. Here we begin, God, and uh, I've mentioned this, I think, in the first study that I taught uh, about uh, putting on Christ. But there's, there's a, a thing that in Bible, in Bible college, uh, Dr. Black in Old Testament taught, and, and that was um, there's a law of first mention. Now, listen, it's not a law. It, it's kind of a, a rule of thumb kind of a thing. It's not always true, but when something significant is mentioned for the first time, it usually is a significant thing. It usually is a defining moment. And so here, the very first mention of love has to do with uh, the promise. It has to do with Abraham, Isaac. It has to do with Christ. It has to do with a shadow of Christ. And I, I, it's very uh, significant. And so uh, love is first mentioned right here in this verse, and we should be drawn to verses like John 3.16, uh, showing God's great love. With, yes? Excuse me, I just think that's a great, uh, a great point. Um, along with that, mm -hmm. that Jesus' baptism. Yeah. I mean, it's the same, same story. Yeah. This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Um, with this command, though, God says, "I want you to take your son, your only son, the son that you love, and I want you to sacrifice him." God has made for Himself a problem. Um, here's the problem. First of all, uh, God is not a liar. Can we say Amen to that? <laughs> We know that, right? God cannot tell a lie. God is not a liar. And yet God has promised that in Isaac, Abraham's family would become as numerous as the stars in the sky, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Now, it's one or the other, right? It's one or the other. Well, with God, it can be both, yes. I've got a question. Back when the sacrifice, you know, they asked, uh, took uh, Isaac to the Mount of Moriah. Now, before the temple was built, they did uh, sacrifices and everything. Yeah. And a tent, you know, the one that they moved around right in. Where was it set now before the temple was built? Was it there? No. On the mount? 
No. It was not. There you go. Shiloh. Yeah, but but you're right. It did move through the wilderness with them everywhere they went, everywhere that the cloud and the pillar of fire moved. Yeah. And uh, we are going to be getting to the tabernacle um, before too long because there's an amazing story there also. Um, but with this command, God has a problem. He's not a liar, and yet he's promised uh, that, that through Isaac, who we don't see any children from Isaac yet, we don't see Isaac being married yet, uh, that's coming up, but not yet. Um, and uh, so what, how do we explain that away? Do we need to explain it away? I think that's why Abraham was able to do what he did. He trusted God's promise. He trusted God's promise that God would break his promise, uh, break his word about he knew, sacrificing. He knew that whether he provided something else. Mrs. Moore, your story doesn't wash. <laughs> whether he provided something else or if he had Abraham follow through and kill his son, right. he could bring his son back to life. Yep. Turn to, turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. We'll let, we'll let God's word tell us what this is all about. Not that I don't trust Marcia. <laughs> I, I love my wife. She puts up with a lot. Yes, I do. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews 11, verse 17. Hang on till we're all there. And I'd like somebody to read verses 17 through 19 nice and loud, please. 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. Okay, so Abraham's faith was such that when God gave him an order, God gave him a command, Abraham said, yes, sir, I will do that. Abraham did not delay. We see that, that uh, the very next morning, he's saddling up the donkey. He's getting the, the supplies ready, and he's on his way to, to fulfill what God has requested. But Abraham's faith said, um, I know God has this problem, just like we discussed. God's not a liar. God made me a promise that, that through my son, uh, all these stars in the heaven, sand on the seashore, my family is going to be huge through Isaac. Um, I think maybe he learned his lesson with uh, Ishmael. Uh, and, uh, and so he, he, uh, he says in, in Hebrews 11 that, that Abraham concluded that if God had him go through with killing his son, sacrificing his son, that God would raise him right back up. And so Abraham says, yes, Lord, I'll do it. If that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. Having faith, and, and it's accounted to, to Abraham for faith, for, for, uh, for faith, for uh, righteousness. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's the reason um, right there that uh, God had a problem, but God really didn't have a problem. Uh, the faith of Abraham won out, and we'll see what happens in the rest of the story for those who may not know the rest of the story. Let's go back to Genesis 22 and have somebody read verse 3, please. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Okay. Um, again, this is obedience. This is obedience. I do not read that the next morning Abraham says, but, um, Lord, can we discuss this a little bit? Uh, I've got some questions. Uh, I don't see that. I don't see him saying, but this is my son, my only son. This is the son of the promise. Are you forgetting? No, he, he saddles up. He's, he's ready to giddy up and, and get this done and, and do what God has asked. Um, and so obedience is not just faith that God will handle it, but obedience walks. Uh, there's there's a, a saying, and I'll say it the right way for anybody who says it the wrong way. 
Um, do you walk the talk? Do you walk the talk? Some people say, yeah, he really talks the talk and walks the walk. No, you either, <laughs> you, you, you talk and then you got to walk the talk. You, you can't just be all, all mouth. Uh, your faith cannot just be words. Your faith has got to walk. Your faith has got to have works. James 2.18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. And then what's James say? I'll show you what? I will show you my faith by my works. God wants to see our faith by our works. Um, not just Abraham, Abraham, if he would have said, God, that's a great plan. I think you're a great God. And, uh, and, and stuttered and stammered and, and procrastinated and didn't do what he was told to do. Uh, that's not faith. Faith is, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I trust you. I trust you, God. You've proven yourself over and over to me. Your word says that you cannot lie. And, and so Abraham saddled up the next day. Let's go on to verse 4 here and, uh, and have somebody read verse 4. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Okay. On the third day. On the third day. On the third day. Where have we heard that before? Many places. I'll tell you what. It behooves us. I'm not saying that every time three days is mentioned, it points to uh, to the resurrection of Christ on the third day. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it, it behooves us to take a good look at whenever three days are, are uh, told in Scripture. Uh, because many of those are shadows. Many of them are. When God spoke to Abraham, he told him to sacrifice a, uh, Isaac. In Abraham's mind and his, in his heart, it was a done deal. It was going to be done. Isaac was as good as dead. Isaac was as good as dead because Abraham had already faithfully settled it in his heart that he was doing it. And, and we see he had the knife raised. I'm convinced God hadn't have said something. The sacrifice would have happened and God would have had to raise Isaac back up. He would have had to, um, but but uh, Isaac was as good as dead. Think about this: when when we're thinking about this matching up to, uh, in many ways, to the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, uh, think about in Luke the parable of the prodigal son. When the father uh, ran out to meet the son. And, and then the older son got upset. Uh, the father told the older son, my son was dead. He's, now he's alive. His son was as good as dead. Isaac was as good as dead in Abraham's heart because Abraham had, had determined, he had settled it in his heart. This was going to happen because God has told me to do it. And I have faith that God will make it all right. And so when, when we look at this, you might say <laughs> that it's not like that because Isaac didn't die. No, I think in Abraham's heart, he was as good as dead, as good as dead. Um, so when the ram was revealed, Isaac rose from the dead. Isaac rose from the dead. Was he dead physically? No, he wasn't. But I'm saying that because of Abraham's faith and because he had settled it in his heart, that's the picture here. Um, is that, and, and look at when, when this ram is found, this ram takes the place of Isaac. He takes the place of me. Praise God. Uh, let's look at, uh, turn to Matthew 12. And I'm going to take you on a left turn that's going to probably leave some of you in the dust, but that's okay. Matthew 12. And verse 39. Oh, hi, Mark. I didn't see you there. Matthew 12. Let's have somebody read verses 39 uh, through 41, please. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the, great, of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
Okay. Did you read through 41? Oh, no. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Okay. Thank you. So verse 40 says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Tell me the similarity between Jonah and the Lord Jesus Christ when it comes to that three days. Some of it's right there for you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but um, Jonah was probably dead. That is what I'm getting at. Let's uh, let's turn to Jonah two. Jonah two. You may not realize exactly how much when Jesus says. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You may not realize how alike those two things are. Jonah 2. Um, when, when we teach our uh, kids Sunday school classes and when, we, um, and when we do vacation Bible school and Jonah is one of the topics, uh, we do these cute little crafty things. I've seen um, like a balloon blown up and they draw a picture of a mouth and stuff on it like it's the whale and they'll put a little guy inside the balloon um, like, like Jonah. I've seen uh, pictures where they have, uh, they'll do a whale and, and there's a cutout in it where you can fold back and see inside the stomach of the whale and Jonah's in there reading a book or something. I don't know. There's, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. I'm going to tell you something. Um, let's, let's look at Jonah chapter 2. And, I, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Yours may be slightly different, but it's going to have the same story. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, uh, his God, from the fish's belly. So Jonah has been thrown overboard. He has been swallowed by the great fish, the whale, whatever it was. Not that important. Uh, it's called both things in Scripture. Um, but one thing you need to know for the world that says oh, no man can live in a fish and, and uh, three days, that's an impossible, this is a big story, uh, you need to know that God prepared that fish. Um, I, I believe, you know, if God wanted to make a fish with a Tupperware, Tupper, Tupperware belly, that's what God would do. I don't know what he did, but, but uh, listen, uh, then Jonah prayed to the Lord. This is after he's been in the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. At this time, Jonah begins to pray. I believe that this is at the end of that three days, as he's about to be vomited up. He is praying to the Lord, and what we're going to see is he is accounting for what happened when he was thrown overboard. Uh, look at verse 3. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me, and all your billows and your waves passed over me. Think about this. I, I just love to think about this. I love to put myself in people's place. It's kind of scary to put yourself in Jonah's place. Jonah is thrown overboard, and I can just see him being thrown overboard. He says, uh, boy, I just turned my computer all messed up. Uh, he says, um, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. He answered me out of the belly of Sheol. I cried. You heard my voice. Uh, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. As he's thrown over, uh, just imagine, he's thrown over, and, and as he's looking at the crew getting smaller, and he's going into the sea, all of a sudden the waves just poof, engulf him. And he says the billows, he's seeing the waves, the, the blowing of the wind across the water as he sinks into, into the deep. And, uh, and he's beginning to sink now into the deep as they threw him over. Uh, verse 4 says, then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, uh, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Uh, Jonah says, 
Um, you, you, you couldn't stand me. You had to get me out of your sight. You threw me, basically, you threw me away like garbage uh, over, overboard. And he says, but I'm going to see your temple again. Uh, verse 5, water surrounded me even to my soul. Listen, he is soaking up in this water. He's beginning to take on water. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. This is sounding hopeless. Weeds are wrapped around my head. I went down, it says in verse 6, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. What is a mooring? What is it? It's the base. It's where it's anchored, right? Where, is, where are the mountains anchored in the sea? So, yeah, they're not, they're not anchored 20 feet under, and then you've got a whole bunch of sea under that. These things are anchored on the floor of the ocean, on the floor of the sea. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Um, bars. I, I looked at different versions of, of uh, the Bible, the ESV, the NIV, um, the NET, the NRSV. They all say bars. Bars, bars, bars. Does yours say bars? Yeah, mine does. Yeah, bars. Uh, you know, when, when, the, when the King James Version was written, um, we were in a period of time in, in the world, we as mankind, uh, we were in like a Shakespeare period. And Shakespeare, in fact, in, in at least one of his plays, talks about the bars of death. It's like when, when the bars of, of life just shut up and you're not allowed back into life. That is, this is taken from that, really. Um, it, now, it's the word of God, but I'm saying it's written in that style. When he talks about the bars uh, are closed behind me forever, I'm telling you, I believe fully that Jonah died. He's got weeds wrapped around his head. He, he has sunk to where the mountains are anchored to the bottom of the sea. I don't know that you get there without a tank to, to breathe with. I don't know that you get there. He says, the, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. There's a sound of permanence here. And then he says, yet you have brought up my life from the pit. Oh, Lord, my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you in your holy temple. Um, I, I'm going to stop there. I, I want you to, to think about this. I think when Jesus says that no sign will be given except for the sign of Jonah, in my mind, when I read this, I think there's so much in common. I think there was a huge miracle. It wasn't just the fish uh, who swallowed Jonah and then vomited him back up. Um, at, at, and by the way, when, when Jonah was vomited back up, God said, look, I'm sorry for being so hard on you. No, he says, okay, now where did we leave off? Oh yeah, go to Nineveh. <laughs> the, the, the orders were still the same. But, but I believe that it is very similar. I believe Jonah died I believe he was taken in by the fish, and I believe probably on that third day, he, he came back and he says, Lord, please, I, I trust you. I'm sorry he repented. And God said, hey, fishy, vomit him up on the, on the shore. And he had another opportunity, and, and he was still stubborn, wasn't he? <laughs> but, but I think it's so similar. And so uh, um, any questions on any of that before we go on? That's good, because I probably can't answer them. <laughs> uh, something to look for in scripture when the bible says someone lifted their eyes it usually points to something significant again when you see three days you really ought to look at that and see is is there some picture is there a shadow there is, is there a message beyond just uh, black ink on white pages um and, and when you see the scripture say he lifted his eyes or he raised his gaze or, or however uh, it's said, it usually points to something significant is about to happen. I'll give you an example. In Luke 6, verse 20, in Luke 6, 20, 
Uh, it says, then he lifted his eyes toward his disciples. This is Jesus. He lifted his eyes toward his disciples and said, blessed are you poor for yours is the kingdom of God. The Beatitudes, Jesus lifted his eyes. Another, another uh, uh, I believe it's Matthew says he opened his mouth and began to teach. Uh, uh, same thing, he, as, he, as he raised his gaze to the disciples, he began to teach and it's a significant teaching. It's the, the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, chapters five, six, and seven of Matthew. Hey, Jim, yes. Uh, I agree with you on the death part. Mm -hmm. He was put in a cave of, of food. Yes. He came. He couldn't be floating in the sea. Right. He was put in, and it says on the, on the great, I know you said psycho for it. Right, right. My, my version says grave. Yeah. So he actually, that was his grave for three days. It was, yeah. And I, I appreciate that because I didn't I didn't say that. But you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, the grave, and his grave was the fish. Yes. I heard a preacher once say... <laughs> <laughs> that the um, Careful who you listen to. <laughs> the great fish that was that God created was a rescue plan, not a punishment. Yeah, it was. It was uh, the fish was not a punishment. The fish was God's rescue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's go back to Genesis twenty-two, verses five and six. If somebody could read those. And Abraham, sa Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad, and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. Okay. Stay here with the donkey. Stay here with the donkey. Um, there were no palm branches this time. In, uh, in this shadow that, that pre-shadowed Christ, there was no palm branches, no shouting of Hosanna, um, no praise going into the city, uh, and no donkey to carry the king of kings. Um, Jesus rode the donkey in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but he sure didn't ride it out, did he? When, when uh, he went to trial and he was uh, sentenced to be crucified. He walked out of the city and, uh, and up the hill. And, uh, the, and Abraham says, stay here with the donkey to the others. Um, this procession sends Jesus walking to his death at Calvary, Mount Moriah. Um, one thing about donkeys that I, I know I've mentioned sometime, I think it was actually in communion I mentioned it, but... Um, don't, and I know some, some people think I'm really silly for thinking this, but uh, donkeys, donkeys that I've seen have a cross on their back. And uh, in fact, um, in Jerusalem, they call them the Jerusalem donkeys. These are the donkeys that have a, a mane of hair, just a thin mane of hair that goes down their back one way and then across their shoulders. And if you're sitting on that donkey, it's a, it's a cross. If you look down on the donkey, there's a cross on the donkey. And, uh, and you may say, Bill, you yeah, have, Jim. But, I'm, you know, you list the number of animals that have crosses on them. <laughs> I'm waiting. You know, I, I believe this was a monogrammed animal from the beginning. I, I think God monogrammed this animal with a cross. I think when Jesus climbed upon this cross to the, to the cheers of the crowd, he was reminded, son, you're going there for a purpose. The purpose is to save these people, and uh, and the cross is the way, and uh, and I believe that that cross was there then, and uh, there's more we can say about donkeys, but I've probably prayed about it too much already. So uh, both of them together, it says uh, that um, we will come back to you for one thing. He, he has so much faith that he says, we will come back to you. Uh, again, in Hebrews 11, it says that he trusted God to raise Isaac from the dead if he had to kill him. Um, and so he says, we will come back to you. That's faith. Stay here with the donkey. We will come back to you. Um, when it says in verse 6, uh, 
Abraham took the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, and the two of them went together. Um, that phrase happens a couple of times here. Um, there is a, a Hebrew word that, that is uh, the two together, and the Hebrew word is, um, and it's one of those you gotta, you got to sound like you're clearing your throat when you say it. Shahad, shahad, uh, and it, it is Y-A-H-A-D, and it means in agreement or united in a purpose. They went together united, they went together as one, they went together with one purpose up that hill. Um, in Isaac's mind, he, he doesn't yet know, right? He doesn't yet know. He's going to ask a question here shortly. But they went up with one purpose. Um, and soon we'll see that Isaac, uh, in Isaac, the shadow of Jesus saying, not my will, but yours be done. Yes, Larry. It said there in 6 that he placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac. They placed the wood, which was made of, with a cross, which was made of wood. And Very good. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we were getting to that. But you're absolutely right. No, I, I appreciate that. And I, you know, when I say that, I'm not scolding you for getting ahead of me. I'm saying, good, good job. You're you're right on it. Um, Abraham put the wood uh, on. He, it says he laid it on Isaac, and Jesus uh, carried his cross. John 19 says it when the other the other gospels say that Simon bore the cross. Uh, we know that Jesus bore it for at least a short time before he wasn't able to because of John 19. John 19 tells us that, uh, that it says, And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which in Hebrew is Golgotha. Um, Abraham told the men to remain there. This was a job for the father and the son only. This was a job for the Father and the Son, and the two of them went with one purpose up the hill. They went in unity up the hill. The saving work of Jesus on the cross was the work of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but the Father and the Son. It is not our work. We did not sacrifice ourselves. We did not do any works worthy of salvation. It was the work of Jesus Christ, and when Jesus said on that cross, to telestai, which means it is finished. You get to go on to the next grade. Uh, it is finished. He finished it. We didn't. It's his work, not ours. In many religions, and I, I hate to compare religions because um, because there is there is one truth. I don't care how you preach it. There's one truth. Uh, and, and no matter how flowery the speech, no matter how good the teacher is at, at uh, explaining a point, um, there is only one truth. And if you're not preaching that one truth, you're wrong. You're just dead wrong. And, uh, and so um, the truth is that there's nothing we can do to, um, to win our salvation. It is a free gift of God. For we are saved by grace through faith. Not of our works, lest anyone should boast. It's, it's not us, and we would boast if we could do it. Um, hey, I finally, I finally filled my punch card. I, I did everything, that, and I'm going to heaven. Uh, we would be bragging on it. And I got there six months before Dave Marks. <laughs> and we, we know that's true. Uh, but, <laughs> no, we don't. Uh, Jesus bore his cross, at least at first, and then Simon. Let's go to uh, Genesis 22 and have somebody read verses 7 and 8. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the iron and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the ram for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the ram for the burnt offering, my son, and the two of them went on together. Okay, the two of them went on together. Uh, is again that word yaha, yaha. Uh, it, they went in agreement. They went as one. Um, the two of them went together. Um, yes. Any idea how he was the first time? 
I don't believe we know the exact age. There are people who will tell you they know the exact age. My best guesstimate, best based on everything I've read, is he's somewhere between 17 and 30. He's not an old guy. He's a young guy, and that's going to come into play here very shortly, too. Um, and, and between verses 8 and 9, I believe we're missing something in Scripture. And you may say, we're not missing anything. The Holy Spirit doesn't miss anything. But the Holy Spirit didn't record something that I believe probably happened. Between verses 8 and 9, I believe there had to be a conversation between Abraham and his son that is not recorded for us. We know there are lots of things that are not recorded for us. And why do I think that? Well, let's do some math here. Uh, that was my next question. How old is Isaac now? I believe he's somewhere between 17 and 30. If, if I had to put a, narrow that guess, I think he's closer to 17 than he is to 30. I think he's a, a young strapping guy. I think he's a, he's a strong young man. How old is Abraham now as this story happens? That's what I got, 100 plus. Yeah, 117 at least, right? So, um, and in fact, let, let's talk about Abraham's health for a minute. Turn to Hebrews 11. Back to Hebrews 11 and verse 11. We're going to talk about Abraham's health at the time that Sarah conceived. If someone would read verses 11 and 12 nice and loud. By faith Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants. <laughs> <laughs> as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. When Sarah conceived, Abraham was as good as dead. He's, he's 100 years old, 100 ish years old, and, and he's as good as dead, it says. Now, <coughs> excuse me, add 17 years at least on that. So if my math uh, is right, my math tells me that. Um, that with great age and the vitality difference, uh, th there is a huge gulf between Abraham's age and Isaac's age. We can agree to that. Regardless of how old they are, there's a huge gap between them. Abraham, good as dead. <laughs> Isaac, young guy. Um, and so Isaac, when, when uh, he says, Father, where's, you know, I... We've got the wood, we've got the knife, we've got all these things. Uh, where's the sacrifice? And, uh, and when his father finally tells him, and I believe he told him on the way up the hill, I don't think it was a surprise. Why? Because any man Isaac's age could easily escape an old guy like Abraham. Could easily escape. And we don't see any conversation beyond this. When, when they get to the hilltop, it says that Abraham bound him. Now, I don't know that, uh, you know, I've seen the show Cops on TV. Uh, Abraham didn't shove him to the ground and cuff him and, and, uh, and then pick him up and put him on the altar. That did not happen. As I see it, it's almost like Isaac just laid down on the altar after, after he was bound hand and foot. He, was, he just laid on the altar uh, of his will. So, um, so I believe there had to be a conversation as they climbed the hill of Calvary. And so I see Isaac and the faith and obedient of, obedience of Jesus Christ. Isaac asked this question, where's the sacrifice? That we're missing something. I believe Abraham told his son what was about to happen. Yeah. He told his son uh, that he had faith that God would raise him from the dead. Yes, Don. Uh, why would uh, why would he bound bind Isaac then? Why would Isaac have to be bound? Yeah, I don't I don't understand that unless that was a, a typical thing. But but there was nothing typical about it. God never asked that human beings would be sacrificed, did He? 
No, huh? he never did. But but when they sacrificed a lamb, um, I don't know if if uh, if you've ever sacrificed a chicken, but if you don't have a chicken, <laughs> if you don't bind a chicken before you cut its head off, uh, you have got a wild, bloody mess on your hands, running all over the place. And uh, and maybe it was just he he was uh, he was fulfilling as a sacrifice as he knew it to be a sacrifice as they would bind a lamb or, or a, a, a cow or a goat, he bound his son in that same manner. That's the only thing I can figure out, Don. Do, do you have a, another idea there? No, I, I'm not. Just, yeah, I, it's, that, that part is a little confusing, but I don't see a big fight on Abraham's hands uh, where Isaac is really resisting at this point. He's, uh, Isaac is being very obedient. Yes, Don. <clears throat> well, there have been several things here I've never thought of before. Yeah. And uh, the binding, Jesus was bound to the cross. Jesus was bound. And there was no need to bind him to the cross. He was willing to die hmm. and go to the cross without being nailed to it. I mean, I know that. And so maybe it's just another foreshadowing of what happened yeah. to Jesus. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I want you to know this too. There's probably so much more riches in what we're looking at than, than my piddly hour is gonna be able to discuss. And I'm gonna to try to contain it to an hour here on this particular topic because there are several that I wanna hit. But um, so if you know of more, and hopefully this encourages you to go back and look at the Akadah, look at Genesis 22 and study it for yourself and see if you don't see uh, the things that we're talking about here. Some of, them, some of them maybe you haven't ever thought of before and it's gonna take you a while to go back and look at it and say, well, is that, is that possible? Is that right? That, that this is a shadow of Christ? Um, I think probably what, what you said about there was probably a conversation between Abraham and Isaac mm -hmm. because Isaac was so compliant that because that's another shadow of Jesus. I mean, it is. Jesus could have easily um, gotten out of going through that or not being on the cross. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 26, 42. Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Jesus uh, says, I don't want to do this. I'm sure Isaac didn't want to do this. Who would want to do that? But Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. I can see Isaac saying, Father, if, if, uh, if God told you this, then his will be done. I don't like it. Jesus didn't like it. It wasn't his first choice. He asked if the father would take that cup away from him, but not his will, but yours be done, Father. In Philippians 2, when we talk about the obedience of Jesus, uh, you don't have to turn there because probably uh, if you're like a lot of us, uh, we can quote this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God gave him a name above every name. Why? He was obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, this shameful death for my sins. Um, this is this is uh, our Lord. Um, I want to get down to um, make sure that I get to uh, verse nine, uh, Genesis twenty-two nine. I'm going to kind of hurry through this so that we do finish in time. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him uh, from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Ladies, it takes twice calling our name sometimes to get our attention, right? <laughs> Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. 
And he said, do not lay a hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Um, and then we're going to go on down to verse 13. And Abraham lifted his eyes. Again, something significant is about to happen here. Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Here's probably the last big point I want to make. is uh, This ram is an amazing thing, right? Um, Abraham will call this place um, God will provide uh, there's, there's a word for that that, that uh, we use called Jehovah Jireh Jehovah Jireh is God's going to provide God will see to it is, is what it means God will see to it He will provide He will make it happen um, Jehovah Jireh um, but when we see this ram caught in a thicket by its horns, um, I want you to think of Jesus and the crown of thorns. That's, uh, that's a picture that I just saw myself a couple of years ago. I didn't see that before. And I heard a fellow preach, and he preached, and he, he said that that ram caught by his horns and when we see horns especially in the book of revelation uh, it's a it's a sign of strength and, and and jesus is the mighty king he is the mighty king of kings and lord of lords but jesus was caught in the thicket he he bowed to his father's will and he put on that crown of shame and this ram is caught in the thicket and uh, and we've talked about that before the the curse that God put on this world because of sin. How he said in, in chapter 3 that thorns and thistles the earth is going to produce as part of this curse. And it was going to be difficult now for Adam to make a living and to, and to feed his family because uh, thorns and thistles. And so Jesus was wearing this crown of shame, the crown of the curse. And, and I see this ram as being a type of Jesus with the crown of thorns as his head is stuck in the thicket and, uh, and John 19 2 says and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns put it on his head um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it there uh, we'll continue with another different passage next week um, anyone have any other comments some big thing that I missed because I'm all ears on that I definitely don't know everything about this. All right. Um, Don, would you close us with prayer? Yeah. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you again for Jim and, and uh, his time and his study, Father, and, and uh, his preparation and, and the word that has been presented tonight, Father. Father, thank you so much for the great example that we saw with Abraham and Isaac, just to remind us, Father, of, of our Lord and Savior and what he went through for us, Father. We're just so thankful that uh, your love allowed him to do that and his love for us that uh, he was willing to go ahead and sacrifice his life, Father, for us. We're just so thankful, Father, for allowing us to be your children, Father, and for the hope that you've given us of eternal life with you. And we just pray, Father, that you be with each one as they travel home and just pray for your safety. And Father, again, thank you for all that you've done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks. <laughs>